Uh, our opening speaker this fall semester is Dr. Jamie Saxon, postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Data and Computing at the Department of Computer Science and the Center for Spatial Data Science in University of Chicago. Uh, my name is Ranjani Srinivasan. I'm a PhD student here at Columbia's Urban Planning Program, and I'll be moderating the session. Uh, I'll start with a few brief technical logistical announcements and then turn to introducing our speaker. Uh, during the talk, I'd like to remind the audience members on Zoom to please mute their microphones. We will be recording today's lecture, so anyone in the audience who wishes to not be recorded should turn off their video input. Audience in Avery 114 who are also connected on Zoom, please be mindful to mute your sound as well. The chat box should only be used for discussion regarding the session. If you have any technical questions that apply only to you, please message my co-host Helena Rong or Carolyn Swope privately. Um, we encourage all of you to type your questions into the chat box during the presentation. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. And we'll start Q&A at around 2 o'clock or 2.15 p.m. so that we will have enough time for everyone's questions. Um, I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you've already had a chance to ask a question, please allow others to do so before asking another one. To ask questions, participants can use the raise the ha your hand feature and we'll call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you may also type your questions into the chat box and I can read them out. And for audience in Avery 114, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you so you can ask your question directly. Um, so with that, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Um, Dr. Saxon is a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Center for D Data and Computing at the University of Chicago where he develops data pipelines to evaluate the availability and accessibility of resources in neighborhoods of American cities. Um, formerly, he was a postdoctoral fellow with the Harris School of Public Policy and the Center for Spatial Data Science at Chicago. Um, originally trained as an experimental physicist, he has expertise in instrumentation, sensors, data acquisition systems, and big data methods. He was also closely involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, and Dr. Saxon's talk today is entitled Structures of Local Mobility in Chicago, which draws from his work, uh, observing the mobility of Chicago residents through a large data set of smartphone users and constructing a neighborhood level mobility network for the city to characterize, characterize neighborhoods according to their local graph stru structure. So Dr. Saxon, if you're ready now, I'll pass things over to you. Cool, can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. So, um, and can you see the can you see the uh, street again? Awesome. Okay. So thank you so much, Ranjani, and, and all of the organizers for making this happen, um, and to everyone for for joining um, today. So this is a project, as Ranjani said, on uh, the structures of local mobility in Chicago, and this project really started on this street which is 61st Street. It defines the line between the University of Chicago on the north side and the neighborhood of Woodlawn to the south. And when I moved to the University of Chicago in the first instance, um, people who had, who had lived here in, in this neighborhood in Hyde Park in years and decades past told me that this was the line that you could not cross, right? This is uh, beyond this line, things are unsafe. Um, and I, who was about to, move in about half a block from here, I was told that I had to find a new apartment because that was gonna, I was gonna get myself killed. Um, and so naturally I was fascinated by this line. Um, and it did happen that uh, several times actually, I would go for a walk along this line um, and, through, and through Woodlawn and then get back to my desk and find an alert from campus security saying that there had been shots fired along the path that I had just taken. Um, but, but this line just captured my interest um, because it, it, it felt like it contradicted some of the shortcuts that we take um, in planning or sociology or economics, namely the things that are close, that are proximate, are accessible, um, and interact with each other. And so you see that in you know, models of walkability to park, park catchments, you see it in econ with the ideas of learning in cities, you see it in sociology with ideas of social cohesion. And you see it in geog geography with you know, Tobler's first law that 
near things are more related than distant things. And here's a space where two neighborhoods come up against each other for a mile. And I perceived, I saw that these interactions across this line uh, were limited. But more than that, the amount of pedestrian activity on the north side of this street um, in this neighborhood was different from the amount of pedestrian activity on this side of the street in Woodlawn. And what I wanted to do was uh, find a way to observe this at a larger scale, not just on this street, but throughout Chicago and ultimately throughout the United States. Um, so I'm not the first one to have examined this street. Actually, Jane Jacobs in the, in the chapter on boundaries in Death and Life of Great American Cities, she talks about 61st Street. It's a sort of a DMZ between the university and Woodlawn. But more broadly, she says that if self-government in a place is to work, there must be a continuity of people who have formed neighborhood networks. Those networks are a city's irreplaceable social capital. And it's totally clear for Jane Jacobs that the idea of neighborhood networks um, bears a spatial imprint, right? We, uh, in our daily routines and in the intricate ballet, as she calls it, of city streets, we are drawn across spaces uh, for cross use between our activities, between the various functions that a healthy neighborhood um, allows. So there's this physical imprint of that. But she also talks about social capital. And although she wasn't the first to do so, she was pretty early um, and she was influential. And I wanted to pull out those two pieces, the impact of this cross use of this ballet of the streets, the neighborhood ties and the social, social capital. Um, in the years after Jacob's work, um, the idea of social capital was formalized and sort of uh, drawn into the network topology of the graph clustering coefficient um, by James Coleman in 1988. So sort of the seminal piece on um, social capital. And the idea here is that focusing on the diagrams in the, in the middle, um, on the top, B and C are not connected to each other, whereas on the bottom, they are. And the idea is that if B is a jerk to A, in the bottom case, C can exercise some form of social control um, on B for having been a jerk, whereas in the top diagram, they can't. There's an interlocking set. There's a return path for the social interactions. It's gonna come back to bite you. But this basic network topology um, has existed since really the dawn of urban sociology. So this is a delinquency triangle drawn from Parks and Burgess, 1925. These are two kids going out on a date somewhere in the city and the way that uh, social control is exerted um, upon them and in, upon their relationship depends on the contexts uh, where they are. More recently, Chris Browning at OSU has done work that brings the um, social closure, graph clustering coefficient, onto a digraph of home neighborhoods and visited locations. And although the, right, we have four here, this is a digraph, um, the basic network topology, the basic sociological idea remains the same. Um, and indeed, he brings us explicitly towards criminality that uh, places that share uh, neighborhoods are going to be in some, uh, in some sense, or neighborhoods and destinations are gonna be healthier um, than places that do not. But Chris uh, had only used um, simulated mobility data for Columbus, Ohio in this study, and I wanted to bring real world routines to it. And so I searched high, high, far and wide uh, and failed many times to try to find uh, this form of data. Uh, and I would love to talk about that. Um, but I ultimately ended up using cell phone uh, location data a little bit earlier than it became uh, widely available and, 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 uh, and popular to do with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so I'm gonna describe how to build neighborhood networks from these cell phone location data. I'll describe the data themselves as well. Then I'm going to uh, describe methods for characterizing the local relationships. And indeed, I really am focused on on, on the local behaviors um, using simple graph properties drawn uh, from um, network analysis. So the social closure here, graph clustering coefficient, if I knew these two places, are they connected to each other? And what I'll call the local out degree, which is just sort of the uh, consistency between 
the empirical relationships with near neighbors and the set of near neighbors. So it's sort of, is K nearest neighbors a good indication of uh, high levels of interaction? And after defining uh, these or constructing these measures, I wanna argue that variation in those measures uh, matters. It matters because it is correlated with status. So it is part of the things, uh, set of things that people experience in uh, privileged and poor environments and cities. I think it is a component of poverty, right? It is a basic expression of what we do with our daily, you know, our, our body on a daily basis. Um, but it is not just a uh, backwards reconstruction of uh, median household income or educational attainment using big data methods. That has actually been done before in a certain, uh, certain sense. What I want to argue instead is that it's actually something more than that. It's not just something that rich people buy. It offers us new ex independent explanatory power when we look towards other social outcomes. And I will focus specifically on crime because uh, that's uh, what Jane, one of Jane Jacobs' hypotheses was. This project came out um, in, the, in Environment and Planning B uh, last year. If there is time, and <laughs> there, there should be, um, I will also talk more about my, my ongoing work to try to really get into um, ground truthing this form of data to open up um, both new ways of doing these studies and also ground truthing uh, what we know about the representativeness and potential biases of the data, data as a form. Okay, so uh, if you're not familiar with this form of data, ultimately it comes down to this. It is three fields. It is a device identifier, a time at which the device was at a place. So a location, a device, a, a device ID, and a time. Uh, the location is encoded as a latitude and longitude. And you'll see also some ancillary fields like precision and things like that. Um, the app that uh, generated, usually you don't know what app it is, but you'll have a unique ID for the app as well. Uh, more recent data sets that have come out um, package up these fields in different ways and give you sort of dwell times or uh, precision based on a longer number of pings um, or characterize the behavior or associate it with uh, a coffee shop. But ultimately, all everything that is done with these data is just coming from uh, these three fields, device, time, location. And so for just uh, the city of Chicago, this is uh, May 2017, one month of data, 600 million points. I'm showing you about 2% of it here. And immediately you see the structure of the city of Chicago. You see the highways standing out. You see the loop, which is the core business district blowing along the lake. I will return to this map over and over again. So I just want to orient you. The suburbs, um, which are the one, you know, one of the two big rich areas of Chicago are on your left to the west. The north side, also wealthier um, up here along the lake. There's some scars running through the city. You have uh, the sanitary and ship canal um, and some industry around it, some uh, transportation hub or depots around here. Uh, and we have the airports, which are a funny case because uh, they have 24 hour operations. And then down here along the south side, we have the neighborhood of Hyde Park where the University of Chicago is, but this is really gonna stand out as an outlier over and again. So the first thing to do is drop all of the imprecise data. So there's a lot of data that don't actually have a GPS fix um, and they, those, these get sort of concentrated in a few locations um, throughout the city. So I do a lot of work to get rid of those. Um, next, I do not consider that it's a real interaction with a neighborhood to drive through it on the Dan Ryan Expressway. And so I flag and remove any locations that are within 10 meters of a highway um, or major, major road as defined by uh, open street maps. Uh, next, I join all of the locations to census tracts so that I know uh, what census tract those locations are in. And then I will impute the home location of each device as the modal, the most frequent device uh, your most frequent tract at night. So now I have basically all of the data 
cleaned and uh, a set of uh, locations as census tracts across the city and for each device, a home location. And now I need to construct mobility as a network. And the question that I'm gonna be asking is how much time do individuals spend in the neighborhoods around their places of residence? And so this is averaged across the residence of each location. And it's uh, a, the graph extends across the entire uh, region, the entire Chicago region. And if I focus on just the local interaction, so I'm just gonna take those set of interactions that are local, um, everyone is related to the loop, to the core business district. I'm gonna ignore this for a moment, just focusing on the local interactions, this graph looks like this. And so what I'm showing you again, same map, suburbs are on the left-hand side, cities on the right-hand side, higher levels of interaction are darker colors, lighter levels, uh, lower levels of interaction are lighter colors. And uh, so the first thing that you will notice is that there are more darker colors, uh, higher levels of interaction with local neighbors in the suburbs than in the cities. And this is sort of trivially um, the same observation as scaling laws of uh, cities. Uh, in that, right, we're, we're less willing to cross over a million people. We're less willing to drive five census tracts away when that entails a longer distance. And so when we have lower density, people are going to remain within the adjacent census tracts more than they do in the city. But within the city, um, we still see pretty enormous variation and specifically uh, the north side has higher level of interaction than the south side. But within the south side, the neighborhood of Hyde Park stands out as an outlier. Now, the basic um, takeaway, the basic message of this analysis is actually going to turn out to be correct. But as I have constructed it, um, it is incomplete and it is flawed. And the reason is that census tracts have different sizes. So this census tract in South Loop, uh, near the core business district, uh, has 18,500 people living here. Um, and some of the census tracts over here on the South side have fewer than 2,000 people because they have suffered depopulation um, over the past decades. And so the amount of interaction with your nearest neighbor well, if you have an 18,000 person population area, right, there's a lot more you know, chances for interaction. And also the uh, extent to which the interaction coming out of this neighborhood is felt is totally outsized when we have this place, it's a factor of 10 larger than some of the tracks down here. And this um, sort of methodological wrinkle um, is called split node invariance. Um, specifically, I do not want the constructed graph quantities um, to be uh, reliant to the extent that I can avoid it on the structure of the sort of arbitrary subdivisions that the census has laid out. I know they're not completely arbitrary, um, but nobody living in the South Loop knows which census tract they're in. And if we divide it in two, we should still have basically the same constructed parameters. And so to do that, uh, I'm going to make a few definitions. First, I'm going to define the time in location L, a census tract L, by a user U as a UL. And I will take the average over all of the users living in a home tract H um, as AHL. So AHL is just the average of AUL for everybody who lives in the neighborhood. That's the graph we were just looking at. To deal with the split node invariance, the fact that people don't know which census tract they live in, but they do know what their neighborhood feels like, we need the census population of each tract, that's NH. I would call big NHK the cumulative population of the K tracts that are nearest to that home tract H. And I will call VH uh, the vicinity of a home location. 
uh, the largest set of k tracts such that n k is less than some threshold, which I will set to 40,000 people. So it's the set of neighboring tracts of constant population. So dealing with the fact that um, the, the tracts may be split in different ways. So with these definitions, uh, we can now proceed. And the first question is to construct the clustering coefficient with weighted edges, different levels of interaction, weighted nodes, different populations, um, and to make that split node invariance. And the question is, do I share destinations with the residents of the places that I visit? Another way of saying this is, am I a mobility peer of the people, uh, or the, the residents of the places where I go? Um, you could also, I sort of think of it as, um, do I share ownership? Um, with people at my destinations of that space. So this again is outgoing interaction, two of them, and then are these connected to each other? We have uh, weighted edges. And then we have um, the influence, the level of connectivity from I to J is diluted at J by the amount of people who live in J. So we have a factor of the census population here. And if I add this all together, basically you see all we're considering is the amount of outgoing interactions and the, uh, on, on the top, bottom, bottom and the top. And uh, these are weighted by the amount of act interactions that are, are actually seen between those destinations. So that's the clustering coefficient. And the local out degree, the question is, do I interact with the neighborhoods in the immediate vicinity of my home? So taking uh, this neighborhood here, we'll look at uh, summing up all of the outgoing interactions to the local neighbors up to this 40,000 person threshold. So at the trivial level or the naive level, I would simply add all of these up, up to 40,000. We have to make a little bit of a correction for this because census tracts don't neatly add up to 40,000. And so there is a little bit left over um, that I will have to add on. So I will take some fraction of the K plus one tract. And I will remove from uh, this sum, the share of interactions that are taking place in the home location. This self interaction is, um, you know, you can think about the spatial scale. Maybe it's good to be sitting on the soup, but dwelling inside of your home permanently is less of a good sign. It's probably um, more of a sign of uh, low employment. And indeed, you know, I, I see that this is negatively correlated with the good outcomes rather than positively as this one is. Okay, so these are the two constructions. How related are uh, neighbor nodes and how related am I to my immediate physical vicinity? So as promised, um, the picture remains largely the same. So the first question is, do I use the neighborhoods in the immediate vicinity of my home? Here we have the local out degree. This is a measure that could theoretically go from zero to one. So the lighter colors are more interactions with the areas around your home. Uh, as before, right? Same basic idea, more interactions with the immediate neighbors in the suburbs than in the city, but variation across the city, higher levels of interaction on the north side, and the south side, and this outlier of Hyde Park. You also see the physical form of the city. Uh, so we see the sanitary and ship canal and industry along here sort of running as a scar through the city. Uh, this is the North branch of the Chicago River. So although these are spatially adjacent, uh, it's actually hard to get there. So if you think of a measure of distance rather than a measure of uh, you know, just immediate proximity sort of queen weights, um, that's what this is showing. Here, this is the Dan Ryan Expressway going down uh, the south side, again, sort of tearing asunder um, in, this, in this local space. There's also uh, an outlier within, so Hyde Park itself is an outlier, but within Hyde Park, we also see an outlier of a single cell. Uh, this is the university hospitals. These have 24 hour operations. And so that shows up as a special case, right? This is a case where assigning home locations based on where you are at night probably is, is less successful. That shows up again um, for a hospital system over on the west side. 
I've taken out the uh, airports because they are such um, such outliers. They're very very special. Ones. So uh, that's the local out degree. If we turn to the clustering coefficient, think of this again as uh, trying to capture the idea of social capital. Um, the question is, do the places I go interact with each other? And the picture is basically the same. We see more interactions uh, in the suburbs broadly than the city, and more uh, within the city on the north side than the west or south sides. And again, this outlier of Hyde Park. So if you are familiar with the city of Chicago, you will see in this map uh, already just a map of class of the city of Chicago. Uh, if you are not familiar with Chicago, uh, that map looks like this. So this is just taking a principal component analysis of uh, some, some factors for socioeconomic status. This is income, education, um, single parenting, and a few others. And what you're seeing right is that the north side is, is wealthier uh, than the west and south sides, and then Hyde Park is an outlier, and the suburbs are rich. So that's the visual impression. If we do this as a scatter plot, um, we see that indeed, uh, as we would have thought, um, there's a very strong relationship between mobility indicators and neighborhood status. So in particular, uh, clustering, log clustering predicts 80% of the variance in adult educational attainment as measured by the census. On this side, for the local out degree, it's a little bit weaker, but it's around 60.64. Uh, okay, so I want to take just a moment uh, and unpack this before moving, moving on. Um, I came at this work originally thinking about um, poverty uh, and neighborhood effects. So if we go back to Molly Orshansky um, and in the 1960s, right, we have just three times food. You, you should have what you need to be out of poverty. And that has moved to the supplemental poverty measure where we try to have a more realistic set of adjustments for uh, geographic um, uh, cost, cost of living, for family size, for um, healthcare expenditures for childcare and so forth. So basically, we're trying to take into account um, how people actually live. But in the last 10 years, um, you know, you, you, you can think of that as being also related to like Marchesen sort of capabilities approach. What are the things that you need to be able to do to be out of poverty, to have a flourishing life in an urban neighborhood? In the last 10 years, economists, Patrick Sharkey, Jacob Faber, um, an economist or sociologist and economist, um, Jim Heckman and Spano Mosso have projects um, uh, encouraging people to, to you know, focus on specific mechanisms um, and experiences of uh, neighborhoods, so context effects. And then in Heckman's case, we sort of have a hierarchy of skills all of the various stacking things that are, that are um, required for the development of human capital. So there's, I think, an, a, a trend towards a focus on each of the individual features or facets that make up um, a flourishing life in a city. If we move a little bit towards the like uh, popular, um, popular literatures, you can also think about like Tennessee Coates and just thinking about uh, your body in the city and uh, the ways that we are able to physically move uh, confidently through our environment. Um, that is, to my mind, an incredibly important part of uh, the freedom and the sort of uh, thrill of living in the city. And we see that that varies substantially across the city. I also wanna think sort of sociologically about the structure of spatial ties. What we just saw is that, um, more pre better prediction of uh, higher levels of interaction with immediate neighbors or neighbors' neighbors uh, was a good thing. It was associated with higher status. Um, earlier work by Nathan Eagle, Luca Papalardo had found that higher network diversity, that is to say higher entropy, which is to say lower predictability, um, is associated with higher status. So there's a sort of apparent tension here. Um, mathematically, that is resolved because I am imposing on this a sp very specific hypothesis about who you need to be related to. You need to be related to the people immediately around your home and you should be consistent to a certain extent with the people uh, in the places that you uh, visit. Um, 
so that's that's mathematically. Um, but it, we we can also think about um, sort of Granovitter, Mark Granovitter, strength of weak ties, and Jane Jacobs, and the sort of conceptual uh, squaring of that circle is that having a cohesion, having a predictability in those local routines is really uh, what allows uh, the weak ties to form and to flourish. The third thing I'm just going to think about a little bit or, 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 or touch on is, is criminality and network effects. And this is a burgeoning literature. Corinna Grave has stuff on dissolution and formation of social ties in the context of, of violent crime. There's stuff on um, how the places that you go and how people who come to you affect levels of crime. I'm really focused just on that um, network structure. And that is closer to work by Chris Browning. And I'm going to focus in on this one and see the extent to which adding my variables um, can give this new independent power. Is this just something that rich people are buying, like park access, living on Central Park? Or is this something that is um, another uh, measurable quantity of neighborhoods? In a slightly more sort of more trivial sense, um, the availability of GPS data is also very important for thinking about criminality. Traditionally, sociological and criminological models sort of rely on residential population, when in fact, right, um, the crime that happens in Chicago, you know, in the, in the downtown district or in Manhattan, right, depends not only on the people who live there, but on the people who come there. And GPS data allow us to start to get to this. This is sim similar to work by Martin Anderson in the British Journal of Criminology. So I'm gonna focus in on criminality just to show you uh, the value of these constructed variables. So the question is, do they give us new independent explanatory power? And to do this, I'm going to construct a spatial error model for logged crime. This is, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with it, this is basically uh, OLS, but the, uh, there is spatial autocorrelation in the error term. I'm choosing this one versus just a space, spatial lag model based on the LM test. And then I have standard uh, controls. So the routine activities theory posits that crime happens when you have a uh, motivated offender and a target uh, coinciding in space and time without an effective guardian present. And so this uh, view privileges uh, just counts of population. So as I said, I have a very robust set of controls here. This is residential locations from the census or residential uh, populations from the census, ambient populations from GPS data, and work populations from the LEHD origin destination origin um, destination employment statistics. And then the second set is social disorganization theory. And here I'm drawing uh, variables very explicitly, um, lifting them with no uh, changes, because what I really, from uh, Samson and Browning and others, because what I really want to do is just say, look, here's the existing model. Am I bringing new information to the table? So do these spatial relationships add to the existing set of covariates? And uh, indeed they do. I know that uh, <laughs> specification tables are impossible to read, but these numbers are uh, quite significant and they are negative. So both clustering and the local out degree are um, conforming to the hypothesis that we get from Jane Jacobs that more cohesive uh, mobility networks are associated with lower levels of criminality, uh, both for violent and property crime. This is, I'm sorry, I should have said this, this analysis is only for the city of Chicago where I have uh, crime numbers. So I'm not focused on suburbs, which is a sort of different context anyway. Um, and this is five years of data so that I'm able to do these logs. This specification is highly, highly robust. So we can change the set of controls that are here. If I had not just followed Chris Browning's lead on this, I would have gotten basically the same answers. Uh, we can change the weights strategy here. I'm using queen weights, but I could have used k nearest neighbors of any number or the estimation strategy. Here I am using um, uh, the, an ML routine, a maximum likelihood routine um, in order to get the um, information criterion, right? So you see that in fact, the AIC has dropped. That is to say the model is better off for having added these two new variables to the model. 
uh, the AIC has dropped from the models without the ones with these uh, variables. Uh, if I had used GMM estimation, I wouldn't have uh, the AIC, um, but the parameter estimates basically would be the same. Uh, still, of course, this is not a causal analysis. And I think it's just as you know, plausible that, or, or likely that uh, you know, crime suppresses street activity as that street activity um, uh, and you know, eyes on the street suppress crime. So there's a great quote uh, from Patrick Sharkey of uh, Robert Snyder in an uneasy piece. He says, in Washington Heights, as elsewhere, residents stepped out of their homes, reclaimed parks and sidewalks, and overcame the fear that had driven so many people indoors during the years of high crime. And what I like about this is um, that we see uh, an active reclaiming of space. People are pushing back out into the space and claiming it for themselves. They're exercising social control, as it were. Um, and on the other side, we had seen um, them driven inside by the crime. And so we see these, these two forces pushing in opposite directions, crime driving people away, people reclaiming space to, to drive out the crime, to um, take it back for themselves. So um, as I said, this is very robust to different covariates, weights, methods, and so forth. Um, but in this context, I wanna focus specifically on the new form of data, um, because that that's that's you know these these analyses are becoming more more frequent, um, but it's still what is new. Here. And so one of the first ways to think about this is to radically change how we do the pre-processing of the underlying GPS location data, how we allow a uh, device to enter into the sample, or how we process the um, location that we see in the sample. So I'm going to do two things. The first thing is to change the deduplication strategy. If we see um, uh, locations that are registered by different apps on a single device um, close, close in time, I will remove those. Um, and the second thing that I can do is require uh, devices to show up more often. So that is to say more nights uh, across the entire month of May, 2017, uh, or more frequently. So more total pings, the average to, the median device has 240 pings, and here I'll just require that the devices have at least 100. Um, and neither of those changes uh, really changes the overall picture. Local out degree, the parameter estimate gets larger, if anything, uh, but in each case, the AIC, um, actually, in, in that case, the AIC actually improves. So we're doing uh, better for having this tighter uh, set of requirements on. Uh, the, um, the underlying data. Another thing that you could ask um, is if it's just the data rates somehow that I'm capturing, maybe people are scared to have out their phones, that's gonna suppress in some way uh, the collection of the locations. So we could look at the median mean ping rate. Uh, parameters for those are not significant and they do not affect the parameter estimates of interest. So that's not, that's not the story. Uh, maybe again, we didn't need to do this analysis at all. I could have just looked to see if there was walkability in a neighborhood and Hyde Park is special as people live and work at the University of Chicago. Um, and that's not uh, the case either, putting in walking or commute times from the census. These are um, not, again, not significant and do not affect uh, the parameters of interest, of interest, interest, interest. Still, and I'm, you, you will see obsessed with this question, there's a question of whether the data are representative. And so the one way that I can get into this is look at the number of devices that appear to be resident um, in a census tract, as opposed to the populations of a census tract. So I will take histograms of the city of Chicago and weight them either by the census population or the number of devices. And consistent with reports from the Pew Research Center on mobile device penetration, you see that this histograms um, for education, it skews high for devices. So educated areas are gonna be a little overrepresented in terms of devices, a little overrepresented in terms of household income, underrepresented in terms of poverty. As is consistent with the Pew Research uh, findings, it's not a huge trend for race 
and a somewhat larger trend uh, for uh, ethnicity. On the whole, uh, I think this is actually painting a, a pretty good picture. We're, we're covering uh, the neighborhoods of Chicago uh, pretty reliably. And I wanna uh, emphasize that what we're really doing um, in the analysis is sort of stratifying within each, uh, with, within each tract. So we're constructing the variables in tract and the assumption that we're relying on is that the people uh, who go out with their smartphone are representative of the mobility of their co uh, of, of their neighbors, um, not that they're representative of people who live in another census tract. Um, still, uh, this reflects uh, device residence rather than out of home activity. And I wanna sort of drive into this because this is what I'm working on now. And so we're stepping into this wonderful world of big data. And the question that I like to think of from Aladdin is, do you trust me? And so the big data is sort of inviting us into this wonderful world of the matrix. Um, to be a little bit more precise than Aladdin, the question, um, is our sample rates consistent across groups and contexts? In other words, do we see the same amount of activity um, per device in a park or a Starbucks or on the roadway or at home? And are different groups of people equally represented uh, or rep represented in proportion to their actual use of those spaces? And I think this is a critical question, not just for this project, um, but also for all of the work um, that um, has uh, relied on this form of data. So there has been uh, quite a bit of academic work, but also sort of popular press work on levels of interaction and contagion, what we formerly would have thought of as social cohesion um, in cities in the context of the pandemic. But is a Starbucks and a park getting the same amount of people per device? That's a critical question if you wanna think about contagion. It's critical if we're thinking about private investment, where do we put the next McDonald's when they franchise? If we're getting a different number of people per device, the footfall, the apparent footfall from GPS data could be very misleading. It's important for public investment. Um, when we think about building parks, right? GPS data will tend in fact to miss kids and the elderly. We don't wanna miss them when we're building parks or planning parks or modifying them. And it's important for this burgeoning uh, academic space. So I'm not the first one to think about this. Um, there is work similar to the histograms that I showed you from uh, location data suppliers like Unicast. This is household income. Again, they're showing you that it's fairly consistent. They actually show you that they are underrepresented at very high levels of income as opposed to what I saw. And in the, in the, that was a different um, data source. Here on the right-hand side, we have work from Amanda Costin and people at um, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, and they're looking at out-of-home behaviors here. And so it's by age along the x-axis and a race along the y-axis. And they're looking at the number of devices per 100, uh, 100 uh, people as measured um, by looking at the excess counts of devices on election day in North Carolina. And what they see in contrast to the in-home levels of activity is that the out-of-home level of levels of activity do show very strong um, trends uh, towards more devices per people in younger, whiter areas. So this is important when we're thinking about what these data represent. To construct this sort of uh, scale factor, um, the population to device ratio, we could look at anything where we have accurate records of the number of people who are there. So think of number of lattes that get sold at a Starbucks or the attendance of a ball game. I'm gonna focus on uh, traffic and I'm gonna talk about computer vision just a little bit in the last uh, few minutes. So strategy one, traffic. I'll compare uh, traffic flows with administrative data, the admin data, are the average daily traffic counts or ADTs from the Illinois State Toll Highway Authority. This is coming from uh, mainline toll plazas like this one and from toll receipts. 
So these are highly, highly accurate. They are released uh, for each month. And so I can associate these ADTs with road segments from OpenStreetMap. And so I hope people get my visual joke for Joseph Minard's March to Moscow, but the width of, uh, the width of these lines represents the daily flow, average daily flow on each one of these road segments. So this is coming from admin data. And now I need to construct the same thing from GPS location data. And the way to do this is to connect endpoints. Um, this is from another data source. This is for um, three months in uh, 2020. Uh, connecting uh, loca uh, travel location behaviors that lead from uh, one location to another, either of those being within 20 kilometers of Chicago or crossing Chicago. And then I have to route those through the OSM network, taking into account uh, travel speeds and so forth. That is done on AWS using PostGIS and PG routing. There are many excellent alternatives to these, all of which can be parallelized on the grid. And once we've done that, we can aggregate up all of those trips. You have like 65 million trips. You route those through the street network and you figure out which uh, road segments those show up at. And then you can compare the road segments that you have admin data for, namely the ones on the toll highway. And what we get is a ratio of 1 to 29. So at first blush, this is not so different um, from the number that I quoted earlier. I said it was about 300,000 people in a 10 million person area. Maybe I forgot to say that. Um, but it's about you know, a 3% sample. Here you got something similar. But in that case, um, it was people showing up over the course of an entire month. And this is activity by activity. Uh, so that's, just, that's strategy one, reconstruct travel flows and compare them to um, uh, sources of, of official data. You can do this with any form of like red light cameras. Um, uh, some places and cities have, have cameras like this. Uh, so any, any uh, ground truth flow, you can do this. Strategy number two is to count entrances um, using GPS or using video. And so here I'm using, looking at a very special park. This is a park uh, along the lakefront of Chicago and it is divided from uh, its neighborhood by a highway. And that means that in order for people to get to this park, they have to go through one of uh, two little tunnels or they have to have come biking uh, along the lakefront. Of course, you can do that. But that means that by focusing uh, on uh, computer vision on one of these two entrances, I can get a pretty good sense of the number of people who are coming into the space. I don't know how long they're dwelling there, uh, how long they're staying, but I know the amount of activity coming in and I can see the amount of activity that is here. So focusing on this entrance, it looks like this. We see people coming through the tunnel and applying some um, you know, careful but not, uh, not extraordinarily complicated computer vision. We can get uh, very, very accurate counts of people coming and going. And so I will compare this for a, a, a like time periods. This is uh, September of last year. And you might think that this is like adorable, but unlikely ever to amount to much because uh, getting access to this camera doesn't scale very well. New York City actually makes a lot of these cameras uh, publicly available at lower frame rate. Um, but there's a lot that I think you could do with this. I have access to full frame rate cameras um, in the city of Chicago as well. Uh, so the city of Chicago has 30,000 cameras up, 2,500 of those um, are near roadways. And so I have subcontract to do work. Um, so there are ways to get the municipal feeds. You don't have to install these cameras uh, yourself. So comparing uh, again, the GPS and computer vision, this looks like this. Here uh, we have the raw location reports or this data supplier clusters uh, the data. And uh, there's some complication to go into that, especially when you think about parks, uh, because you may walk through a park and a cluster may never really end up being in the park. So the ratio is about one to 30 for this specific activity of showing up in the park or one to 40 for clustered data. Um, by way of comparison, 
to the same period at night, the average number of clusters in Chicago on a single night, think of that as a single activity again, there's 28,000 devices on 2.7 million people in the city. That's about one in a hundred. So these are, that's for clustered. So sort of think about one in a hundred versus one in 40. Two activities, how much are those two activities um, picked up? A lot more for uh, the activity that shows up in the park than uh, at home. Just sort of uh, stepping back, right? At least one month in the city um, or over the course of a month is about a one in 33 sample. Any specific month, uh, day or night in, in, in the city, everyone has to go somewhere. So they've got to be somewhere, right? It's about one in 100. Clustered data in parks is about one in 40. Tollways, we see something more like one in 30 for clustered or for the travel um, flagged behaviors. What this means is that uh, context by context, we may be picking up you know, different amounts of people. And I think it's important um, moving forward um, to get, get at that. I also think that there's immense uh, promise in computer vision for moving beyond GPS data to see how people are really sharing space. Because as you can see, right, in the park, we're getting um, one device per 40 people. Uh, and that means that we can't really see how people are in the space together. Uh, since I'm coming up to time, I'm actually going to skip this slide, but I just want to uh, point out that right, we also want to look at um, how different groups are represented in the course of their daily activities. That's similar to uh, the work of Amanda Costin and, and the voting returns that I mentioned. And so we can look at, based on the home locations of devices and the uh, composition of people who are coming to each road segment, um, are individual road segments more or less observed? Um, and to, to, to break the surprise, there is, there, there is bias in the data. Um, so to summarize, um, I characterized human mobility in Chicago neighborhoods um, using a network base or built from GPS location data, uh, using uh, clustering coefficient and nearest neighbors interactions. These were closely inspired by existing work from Jane Jacobs, other planners uh, across geographic analysis and sociology. And we saw that mobility is strongly correlated with class. And indeed, I would argue it is a component of class. Consistent with Jacobs theory and work by like Chris Browning, um, it is also uh, has independent predictive power for crime uh, with the right sign. Looking forward, uh, GPS data have an extraordinary strengths in their scalability so, uh, and their ability to capture activity between geographies. So that means um, the ability to directly address questions of external validity, um, but also to look at you know, people coming from here, going to there where people are related to. You can't do that with a uh, traffic count. You can't do that with computer vision. You don't know where they came from. To my mind, the data are surprisingly representative of the population, although not perfect. Um, and continued work is needed to assess these biases and to apply these uh, data in context where we really have a responsibility to get it right in planning uh, cities. Because the data are fairly sparse, right? A one in 30 sample, one in 40 sample, 100, complementary techniques like computer vision can help us to measure and optimize specific resources. So I've you know, had talks with um, Parks District in Chicago or Department of Public Health and Mental Hygiene in New York about you know, what is the impact if, if we put in a work of art? Do people dwell more? Uh, what happens if we change the lighting? Right? Do we see um, interventions on the physical environment changing how people are using and sharing spaces? And that comes to the last thing which is that spatial routines usually express um, some sort of a social routine, but computer vision, I hope, <laughs> will help us to begin to disentangle those and see how people are really using spaces. So as an example there, right, I often go to the park and pass by a bunch of old guys playing chess, and I do not play chess. Um, so they are clearly having a different social interaction than I am having. Um, and yet I feel somehow closer to my neighborhood uh, for having walked by them on my walk. Um, 
So thank you uh, for your attention and your time. Um, and I'm eager for your discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Saxon, for your talk. Uh, and I would like to open up the session for questions. Um, as a reminder to ask questions, participants on Zoom are encouraged to use the raise your hand feature. And I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you may also type your questions in the chat box and I can read them out. For audience in every 114, you can raise your hand and I'll call out on you so you can ask your question directly. So um, I, see, I see first the, uh, the question from um, Calvin Harrison, if I can just start with that one. Um, and the question says, technologies uh, I explained are, are super powerful for um, you know, academic work and so forth. How can we make sure that this is not applied to more nefarious uh, uses like tracking by government and profiling and so forth? Um, and that's right, that's a great and super important question. Um, and this, I think this sort of comes up um, for me a little bit in the context of uh, reports that came out from the New York Times like last year, they put out in 2014, they had reports on this, they're like, look, this is gonna change the city, everything's gonna be better because we're gonna be able to use the curb efficiently. And then in 2020, they said, oh my gosh. And you know, like literally the uh, headlines are green typeface on a black background. Um, the headline is like, your smartphone is spying on you. What can you do about it? Um, and the New York Times piece to me felt a little bit unfair because um, they went and sort of uh, did the things that you're not supposed to do with these data. Um, I am contractually not allowed to do a lot of the things that they did um, by my IRB. I am not allowed to do a lot of things that they did. And it felt a little bit to me um, like they sort of like walked out on the street and they're like, boom, somebody got shot. The crime is terrible here. And so it felt, it felt a little bit unfair. Now, clearly um, nefarious actors um, or the government can get access to these data, although there are actually limitations on what the government is, is allowed to use it for. Um, and so what I see is that this industry um, is very aware of its responsibility um, in vetting people who, uh, who get access to the data, but also in changing the way that they are making the uh, data available to users. And so that means um, using much, much more processed data. I do have access to raw data, um, but if you get things from SafeGraph now, or you get things from uh, Unicast now, they have constructed uh, networks. They have um, constructed levels of flows from block groups to you know, a coffee shop or something like this that um, aim to directly address uh, the privacy concerns. I also think that um, you are seeing you know, uh, a trend towards better awareness, you know, thanks to things like the New York Times um, of privacy issues. And so if you look at Android or iOS, both of these are um, implementing uh, much more widespread do not track features. And you can imagine um, in the context of GDPR, the European privacy laws, um, you can do do not track. You can imagine plugging that directly into your phone so it would apply widely. Um, now would make it much harder to build data sources um, like this. That is where we are moving in terms of the advertiser ID, which is a unique identifier that identifies people across all of this. Obviously it makes a lot of these uh, analyses more challenging. Um, this is what has happened in the past for other forms of data. So it is hap what happened with uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth probes. Both of those specifications um, switched to randomizing the device identifier when it is not associated with a network to um, make this type of thing impossible. And iOS and Android are building that in for the ad ID as well. So I think that is where we are moving, both at the OS level and also in the at the uh, data level and also at the consumer level. You can see, um, you know, in, in my discussions with industry, right, you um, see that they're actually able to do a lot of the things that we are interested in um, with less tracking of people. Um, over time, we can remove all, uh, all, all behaviors that are, uh, you know, very close to home um, and remove that in various ways. Um, 
so, so that that's where I think this is moving. I think the industry is very, um, I mean, I, I not, I think, I know that the industry is very concerned about this um, because if they do not get it right, um, it's, uh, uh, it will make it harder for them to do all of their work that I think, you know, I, I believe um, that there is tremendous potential uh, in it. So um, maybe that's not a complete, this is, this is a huge, huge space, uh, but maybe that's a first, um, first response to your question, right? Do not give people access to the data that they do not need. Do not collect the data that we will never need. Um, the, you know, the challenge that this brings up, though, is if we are not recording that type of thing, um, for some things like looking at the data representativeness, it actually makes it even harder, right? Because we have no way of reconstructing where people are coming from and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have another um, question in the audience. Oh. Hi, um, can, can you hear me all the way back here? Or well, well yeah. enough? Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, I found it very interesting. I lived in uh, Hyde Park from 1996 to 2001. My wife was a grad student at the University of Chicago. I have fond memories of all those places um, and definitely familiar with the boundaries that you mentioned. But I was wondering when you began your research, did you do any? Or, did you do any historical research to the neighborhood? Because my understanding is that Hyde Park uh, was a deliberately planned community, really starting ironically around the time James Jacobs was writing. It was planned by the university and city authorities to limit uh, the flow of people from the south side into that neighborhood, that the university specifically wanted to carve out Hyde Park uh, as an enclave and uh, relied on the city's power of eminent domain to remove commercial activity from 55th Street, where you have like the university, that, that little loop there in the upper right hand corner of the university parks. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, wow. yeah. So, so this is, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of history here. Um, yeah, so the, the basic story of this line, this DMZ, um, is that in 1957, um, George Beadle comes to the university as president um, in a time when the whole, um, uh, the whole neighborhood is, um, is, is, is really, uh, in, in, in a sense, under, under real threat. The university is not able to attract faculty anymore. Um, there is real violence. The, you know, the, one, of, one of the contradictions that I couldn't uh, resolve when I was looking at this was literally which rape and hostage situation it was that finally drove the university crazy. Um, and uh, George Beadle made Julian Levy uh, sort of responsible for urban planning in Hyde Park in that period. Julian Levy was the brother of Edward Levy, who later was the president and U.S. Attorney General, so very, very strong ties to power. And he shows up in Eisenhower's, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the White House, and basically says, I want a meeting, and boom, they have it uh, like three days later, and he says, we want to raise huge swaths of Hyde Park. So you're probably familiar with Hyde Park A and B, the I and Pay, and um, uh, Harry Weiss development um, that sort of decimated 55th Street, as you said. Um, but Julian Levy also focused on 61st Street. He actually wanted to put in, you know, very, very analogous to Jane Jacobs, but he failed. He wanted to put in a crosstown expressway to permanently, you know, conclusively separate Hyde Park from Woodlawn on 61st Street. And he failed in that. Um, but if you walk through the physical environment in this space, I mean, it's it, not to bite the hand that feeds me too much, but to bite it a little bit, you know, it's bad. Um, so if you, if you enter the University of Chicago from the east, right, you meet with welcome to University of Chicago signs. This is what it looks like coming to it from the west. This is where I used to live at. Um, this is, so uh, here we are facing south on Kimbark or facing north. Now, the midway blocks flows but that's not good enough. Uh, we have to have fences up and a playing field. So there's two sides of the fences. Um, this is again, coming down to the opposite side of these fences. And so 
rather than seeing welcome to the University of Chicago, we've got fences and the street does not uh, go through as you can sort of see down here. If we go over uh, one block, again, the street does not go through. They do not want people coming through. Um, the policy school where I was was just redesigned. So this is um, this is uh, uh, Edward L. Snow built, or um, yeah, I think right uh, building. Um, it's redesigned. Has ten foot walls that basically keep people out, so the street is broken again. Even though you have the midway, just one block later. If you go over by one block, again, the streets are broken. So over and over again, um, the, uh, you know, the, the history of Hyde Park is felt in the, in the physical environment that you feel here. Um, you know, you see uh, there's a guy standing here in a blue coat. He's one of the people that are hired by the university. Uh, you talk to these guys and, you know, it's a very complicated relationship. Um, and, but there was an old guy that I would often talk to and he's like, oh, you know, kids come into the neighborhood every night, but we chase them out. I mean, you can think about that, about that statement a lot. Um, so this, yeah, it's no, it's no coincidence that Jane Jacobs focused on this line in particular. Um, unfortunately, I would say the University of Chicago in its South Campus development plans is very much sticking to its guns. If you walk along 55th Street now, you would not recognize it from when you were here in, um, in the late 90s and early 2001, they put in this huge Genie Gang building, this commerce that they're trying to uh, uh, encourage along the street. They are not doing that along 61st Street. So I don't know if that exactly responds to your question. We've come back from the global to the local again, but yeah, you definitely see sort of the built environment affecting, um, affecting these flows um, in sort of obvious um, and uh, very in your face ways. Okay. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yes, it does. I think that's very interesting as a preface towards what you're collecting today, just acknowledging that this is, in fact, a planned environment. It's not an organic. No, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. And it's also, in a way, a microcosm for so much of Chicago writ large. The physical environment is, was, has been changed over a century to limit human interactions right i mean the, the whole set of <laughs> if, we, if we, we could talk we, we could talk for another hour about road cuts in hyde park that are weird but I mean, maybe we can go to another question sure. sorry yeah i think this no, no. audience yeah go ahead mauricio uh can you hear me can you hear me uh can you hear me? yeah it's a little it's a little warbly okay uh, uh, okay yeah so uh, can you hear me now, I think? Yeah, yeah. Great. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a, actually a couple of questions. One, uh, the first one is like, uh, given that there are some recent changes in mobility behavior, maybe accelerated from the pandemic, like um, the increase of use of bikes and also maybe the work from home. And I was wondering like, how do you think these uh, changes uh, can change, can alter your results? And my second question is more methodological. Um, so I was also wondering if you have explored other social network uh, analysis tools, uh, like for like uh, that, which can offer different angles, like for example, centrality measures to know which uh, neighborhood will be. Uh, might be more important or more connected to the other ones. Right. Those are those are both great questions. Um, so I'm just trying to jot them down so I don't forget. Um, so the first one is the COVID um, changes. Um, <laughs> I don't know that there's a way to talk about COVID that's not at least a little bit depressing. But right, mobility has gone down. We are seeing each other less. I am not there with you in New York. Um, and I believe that the actual social uh, behaviors in the park, uh, you know, through, through, through throughout the neighborhood and in the parks and in person are incredibly uh, important, as you can see through this. And I think we're not having those. Um, from a research perspective, yeah, I mean, I looked at, uh, I looked very early on after the pandemic started at how, um, you know, changes in mobility um, um, change in the context of the pandemic. 
I did not sort of jump on the COVID bandwagon because I was already living through it and I couldn't quite uh, stomach it. But um, you, you, you know, you see, and you can find many other people who've done this. I think I like wrote like a blog post about it, but I didn't pursue it much further. Um, just that, you know, people from rich neighborhoods um, before the pandemic were going out more as soon as the pandemic hits and they need to self isolate in the first months, they're doing so much more. And so, you know, mobility starts out as a privilege and then um, uh, isolation turns into the privilege. And of course, whoever is privileged gets both of those things. Um, as for thinking about, uh, you know, how it has changed in COVID, I haven't looked at it um, more than that. Um, as for centrality and other measures, I thought about a lot about these. Centrality, um, uh, you know, so I, so I did construct them. I, I wanted to focus on things that had a sort of a deeper theoretical grounding to them. I can tell you that uh, centrality you know, sort of picks up the um, central business district. So it picks up Midtown Manhattan, it picks up the loop and so forth. Um, and that's great. Uh, it's not as related to uh, uh, the other social outcomes as the, the, the variables that I described. The other thing that I have been considering, right, is, you know, as, as I mentioned, this form of data uh, invites you to uh, bring it to other um, cities, social contexts to deal with external validity and so forth. Um, another paper with people in the psych department looking at uh, park use, which is another constructed thing. It's not a graph measure, but um, maybe think of it as a di digraph of parks if you want. Um, but uh, taking those variables and um, bringing them to specifically to New York City. Um, and because the psychologists were less fam familiar and comfortable with the, um, uh, the clustering coefficient, they, they wanted to focus on the local app degree. There, the, the, the analysis did replicate very, very successfully to New York. Um, but looking at these same measures um, in other cities, um, I think is important. And if I look at uh, like Philadelphia, the clustering coefficient again doesn't do nearly so well. Uh, does it doesn't do nearly so well as the clustering coefficient? So taking some of these variables and looking at them in other contexts, I think is important. Another one um, that is not exactly getting at your question about uh, other sort of traditional graph measures, um, but to think from a geographic analysis perspective, right? I defined um, for the local out degree, a, a, a very specific scale. And I define that scale in terms of the human population. So it's a 40,000 person area, right? I could have chosen a different scale. Maybe I should have, right? Because, you know, like if we look at, uh, you know, um, uh, like literatures on, uh, on, on job referral networks and economics, right? The instrument that they end up using is uh, shared jobs within census blocks. So a much, much smaller geography than I use, a 40,000 person area. Right. So thinking about uh, different scales to uh, construct uh, those uh, measures on and how that uh, depends on which city we're looking at is, is one of the directions that I want to be, um, you know, going next after the data bias questions and after the how do people share their parts together. Um, so I think uh, I have a question. And Please. That I, I'm start. supposed to stay on with students at this point, so I'm, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I love this stuff, so, so I'm here. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering about um, the aerial unit you've chosen to aggregate the mobile data to, which is the census tract. I was wondering, um, do you think that there would be any change if you used another aerial unit? Like what was your uh, methodological reason to choose that particular one? Right, I mean, so this is, this is related to literally what I just said about like, what is the correct spatial scale? Um, you know, I, there, there's, there's a couple of answers to this, I think all of which are cop-outs. And um, uh, I, I, I think thinking about the spatial scale is actually one of the next things that I really wanna do. The reason that I used census tracts is because um, it aligned with all of the other variables that I was ever going to want to use. Um, and so when I went to construct neighborhood covariates, um, those are not always available down to the block group level and so forth. And the other sort of cop-out answer, I mean, these are cop-outs, but, but there, there are real data issues of trying to go much more, um, much finer. The other one is that the university and the, uh, with the IRB, uh, 
Um, I'm not, not exactly sure how realistic their concern is, um, but basically they were concerned uh, going much uh, finer than census tracts for the um, overall analyses. And they have just been much, much more comfortable with me sticking with high level, um, uh, high level home uh, neighborhoods. That is not always possible, right? If you wanna think about, are you going to the park? You do need to veto the home but the park that is 50 meters away may be in your track and it may be the most relevant and most important park. And so you cannot just do things at the census track level. You may need to know really where it is. Um, but what I basically try to do um, is uh, construct all the variables that I need and then get away from the raw data as quickly as I can because basically I don't wanna be touching it um, off of the grid. All of this stuff is, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All, all of this stuff, basically the university doesn't want it ever to touch the university's servers because they don't want GDPR on their servers. So yeah. Um, so th those are, you know, they're, they're not uh, conceptual answers, but they're reasons. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's really helpful because I mean, I know that the IRB guidelines and all that sort of really influence the way you conceptualize your study from the very beginning. So, yeah. But um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think we are out of time, but um, on the behalf of GSAP and the urban planning program in particular, I'd like to thank you um, for presenting today. I mean, we really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it was, it was great, and thank you. Yeah, and um, for everyone else, uh, make sure to join us next week at the same time for our next Lips Talks uh, talk by Dr. Rob Kitchen, uh, whose talk will be on the epistemology, praxis, and uh, politics of urban science and city dashboards. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Ranjani, am I, am I to stay here to chat with students? Is that from what I understood from email or am I? I, I think that, um, or... I think everyone is having a bit of a busy week, so we might need to reschedule that. Um, yeah, I think the semester, unfortunately, is in full swing, so. Okay, all right, sure, sure. Yeah, but thank you so much. It was fascinating. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Also, the data sources that you had, so, which was, yeah. uh, you know, we don't really get access to that. Uh, so, it was, it was amazing to know what was possible. So, yeah. I will, I will, I will say that you can get access. You just have to be annoying. So, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. I really, I, I 